In our last lecture on kinetics and dynamics, I want to look at tunneling, variational transition state theory, and finally Marcus theory. So let's look at quantum effects on the rate constant associated with the probability of a reaction proceeding through a parabolic barrier. So imagine that I have a, uh, a barrier that's a parabola and it has a certain height call that height above the reactant delta V double dagger. So in a classical world, if I were to plot the probability of a system moving from left to right towards that barrier of going beyond the barrier, I would have zero probability, zero, 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 until I get to exactly the energy of activation, at which point I would have unit probability. I would just go zooming right over. There's that barrier underneath me and I just don't care. So that's a classical world. Now it turns out that in a quantum mechanical world there is a probability at lower than the reactant energy that you can tunnel through the barrier. There is also a probability, a non-zero probability, above the energy required to pass over that you will be non-classically reflected as you attempt to go over the barrier. And uh, so for a parabolic barrier, the shape of this sort of S-curve is such that the amount of uh, tunneling that takes place is equal and opposite to the amount of non-classical reflection on either side of the activation energy. So on the one hand, you might say, well, that's wonderful because uh, quantum mechanics has made my life easy. I get a cancellation between the extra rate associated with tunneling compared to the diminution of the rate associated with non-classical reflection. And that would be true if you had just as many systems tunneling as you had being reflected. The trouble is if you think about a temperature dependent Boltzmann distribution, so here is the distribution of energies well, there are a whole lot more systems that can take advantage of tunneling than there are systems that have enough energy to worry about non-classical reflection. And so tunneling can tremendously uh, increase the rate of a reaction beyond what's expected. And usually the way that this is uh, put into transition state theory is to imagine here we have the, the transition state theory expression for a unimolecular reaction and I've just emphasized uh, units again by putting in the, the partition function uh, standard states. But you just put a prefactor in, kappa. So kappa would be equal to exactly 1 if tunneling and non-classical reflection are playing no role. But if there is a significant tunneling influence, kappa will be greater than 1. And kappa depends on temperature. And so to give you a feel for how kappa depends on temperature, if we think about the log of the rate constant and we were to plot it against 1 over t, and so by plotting against 1 over t, that means over on uh, this end of the curve is very, very low temperatures. So at very, very high temperatures, that's this part of the curve, there's really not much of a role for tunneling necessarily because every system has enough energy to go over the top of the barrier. And so we get fairly classic if we were to do an, uh, an well, I say Iring plot here, that would be log k over t, of course, not log k. This is really an Arrhenius plot, I guess. But uh, in any case, you see roughly linear behavior. And from this behavior, you would extract things like the activation energy or the enthalpy, if this really were an Iring plot. However, as you get colder and colder and colder, what you observe is over a certain regime, which I'll call the turnover regime, you ultimately get to a regime where the rate is independent of the temperature. And why is that? Well, it's kind of an unusual regime. You'll rarely encounter it. But you have every system, essentially, in its lowest possible energy state. And that means that the only way it can react is through tunneling. And so you're just looking at the tunneling rate. And everything is tunneling. Because light isotopes tunnel uh, faster than heavy isotopes, because tunneling depends on mass. So tunneling is more efficient for lighter things than it is for heavier things. It takes the heavy isotope longer to get to the all tunneling regime and tunneling is less likely so it has a lower rate constant but it too will ultimately flatten out and react through tunneling. And so uh, this can be quite complicating when you're trying to interpret kinetic data 
because unless you are measuring over a large enough range to see this kind of curvature, you may be fitting this to an I-ring or an Arrhenius expression where you really shouldn't because the tunneling is influencing where the points are. Okay, so tunneling in a nutshell. Typically only significant for reaction coordinates that have large proton, H-atom, or hydride motion. And that's because of the dependence of tunneling efficiency on mass. If you get much more massive than a hydrogen atom, you just have very, very slow tunneling rates. It's not unheard of to see heavy atom tunneling, but certainly it's quite rare. It's also less significant at higher temperatures, but nevertheless, it's, it's well established that biological systems at biological temperatures can have a significant component of the rate uh, being through tunneling. Putting tunneling into a calculation is actually not entirely trivial. Although the Skagi Trular approximation from the University of Minnesota, Don Trular with uh, Rex Skagi, a former student, which we'll look at in a moment, is, is pretty straightforward to apply. And I'll emphasize again that it's quite dangerous to interpret experimental data to compare them to experiment, sorry, to compare theory to experiment if the experimental data include tunneling, because it's just there in the physics, in what's happening in the flask, but you aren't including it in a calculation. And I'll, I'll show an example of that in a moment. So this actually is a, a screenshot out of the uh, 1981 paper by uh, Rex Skagi and Don Trular uh, explaining how to do parabolic tunneling calculations. And it, it is pretty straightforward. You see that kappa is expressed in terms of alpha, beta, and delta V double dagger, and then V. And what are these? Well, Delta V double dagger is the usual uh, uh, activation energy, and then this V actually is uh, for reactions that are not uh, uh, perfectly exothermic, but, okay, let's not worry about that. I'll let you go look up in the paper when you need to put that in. Uh, beta and alpha, beta is just one over KT, the usual beta. Alpha involves the imaginary frequency, so it's the magnitude of the imaginary frequency. And the reason I'm pointing this out, I don't want to go into details in the formulas, but just to show that all that's required here is an electronic structure frequency calculation. You'll get the imaginary frequency, you get the energies of activation that you need, and you're done. You're ready to compute kappa. And you use one of these two formulas depending on uh, how alpha compares to beta. And when alpha is equal to beta, they're both equally good. Okay, so I promised I'd, I'd show an example maybe to try to make this more clear and when it's important. So this is uh, out of my own labs with a former student, Ed Shearer, and it's looking at the metathesis of labeled methane with uh, lutetiocene, methyl lutetiocene. And so if this is lutetium, this uh, metal atom here, turns out the methyl can exchange with methane gas in the medium, and if you label the methane gas, you'll see this, uh, you have this four centered transition state as an incoming methane donates a hydride to an outgoing methyl that's becoming methane and you just swap. So in the absence of an isotope this would be an identity reaction but with an isotope it's something that you could potentially follow. And the relevant structures if you like, this is a, a side view of the reactant and uh, let's see this is a, a I'm sorry, this is, a, this is the reactant here. This is the transition state structure. So here we have a side view. It's hard to see any difference there. Here you have a top view. That's not necessarily so informative either. But here's the view actually looking down the axis towards the metal. So the metal's behind. In the reactant, there's a methyl group. But in the transition state structure, there's two nominal methyl groups. And this hydrogen atom is in flight between the two. And so delta H double dagger... If you do a calculation with a uh, uh, generalized gradient approximation functional and an effective core potential, you predict an enthalpy of activation of 20.3 kcals per mole. And from an Eyring plot done by experimentalists who studied this reaction, the enthalpy of activation is 11.6 kcals per mole. So that's a huge difference, right? It's almost 9 kcals per mole. That's a pretty bad day for a theorist. So one scratches one's head and wonders what's going on. That's a pretty reputable functional, and this was a pretty decent basis set. But the issue is that that 11.6 derived from experiment is in some sense fooled, I say here in the title, or poisoned by tunneling. So these are the actual data. 
measured from 300 to 400 Kelvin. So that's, you know, room temperature up to pretty warm. You don't necessarily worry about tunneling at those temperatures. But remember, we've got a hydrogen atom in flight. It's very light. And here are the observed rate constants, and they range from 10 to 1800. So if you plot this with an Eyring plot, that is, plot these uh, log k over t versus 1 over t, that's how you get that delta h double dagger equal 11.6, because the slope of that Eyring plot can be interpreted to give delta h double dagger. The problem is, though, that transition state theory doesn't envision tunneling. If you compute, using the skaji trular approximation, the kappa value, you find actually that it's 93 at room temperature. So the reaction's 93 times faster than it would otherwise be expected to be because of tunneling. Meanwhile, by the time you're up to 400 Kelvin, it's only four times faster. That's still pretty impressive that tunneling is actually accelerating the reaction by a factor of four. But remember what a factor of four is like. It's, uh, it is equivalent to maybe a less than a kcal per mole, probably at this temperature. Remember, an order of magnitude, a factor of 10, is 1.36 kcals per mole at room temperature. And so this is not a factor of 10. It's, it's less, and it's a higher temperature. So it's equivalent to lowering a barrier a bit. But this, on the other hand, that's, that's significant. OK, but in any case, really then we ought to be dividing these observed rate constants by these kappa values to come up with the semi-classical rate constants that really are the ones that should be input to an Eyring uh, plot. If you do that, if you plot these log k over t versus 1 over t, then you get a value of 19.2. And remember from the prior slide that the DFT calculation says 20.3. So within 1 kcal per mole. And that's the way it really should be. That is, on the potential energy surface that includes the corrections for enthalpy, the enthalpy of activation really is order 20. The apparent reaction having a lower enthalpy is just associated with tunneling increasing the rate of the reaction. Well, as long as we're talking about uh, the potential for things to influence the position of barriers, let's talk about variational transition state theory. So remember I said that in the case of uh, transition state theory, we had an energy and we were thinking of going from a reactant to an activated complex. On the other hand, if we really work in free energy, which is the relevant quantity for reactions carried out at uh, constant pressure, well, the position of the transition state structure, maybe we should call it, we should go back to the old language of activated complex, can move because included in G are all the components coming from translation, rotation, vibration. And so it may be further along the reaction coordinate that free energy is maximized compared to potential energy. So in variational transition state theory, the rate constant is expressed as a function not just of temperature, which already appeared in normal transition state theory, but also as a function of the reaction coordinate. And the rate constant will be the minimum, because we have to go to the maximum in free energy in order to get over that barrier, in order to have a rate, the minimum along the reaction coordinate of the transition state theory expression. So that's what differentiates variational transition state theory. It's variational, right? It looks for a minimum or a maximum associated with some parameter. And in this case, it's the reaction coordinate parameter. So if all you do is you compute a transition state structure and you then compute G for that transition state structure, which is you know, the typical way that people might do rate constants, that's called canonical variational transition state theory, you in this drawing will be missing a little bit of extra free energy that still needs to be provided to get over the hump because as we go along the reaction coordinate, maybe we're tightening up some vibrations and that leads to uh, a higher zero point along the coordinate. It leads to maybe thermal contributions. In any case, here's the free energy maximum. And note, incidentally, that that position along the coordinate may be different for different isotopes, H versus D, because the partition functions will be different. And so if this is the activated complex for H, it looks like here. If this is D, it might be here. 
And again, just using the transition state structure and computing isotope effects for that structure, comparing this to this, may not be as good as comparing this to this. So using the variational approach, one can uh, often do better on uh, isotope effect calculations, as well as rate constant calculations. All right, the last uh, problem I'd like to look at is electron transfer. So here's a, a problem in kinetic isotope effects that's quite difficult. And so in electron transfer theory, a, a common model that's used is called Marcus theory. And in Marcus theory, you envision two states. You have a state where the electron is, in, in my drawing here, associated with molecule A, and B is, in this case, neutral, and the extra electron makes A anionic. And there's another state where the electron is transferred, so A becomes neutral and B is anionic. And in Marcus theory, what you're interested in is the curve crossing between these two states where the reaction coordinate is not necessarily a geometric coordinate, it might actually be a, let's say, a solvent coordinate. That is, as the solvent is undergoing thermal fluctuations, the energy of this state is fluctuating with the solvent, and for certain solvent configurations, the two possible states would be equal in energy, and it's at that point that you might expect the uh, electron to continue to hop over onto the other side. And simply by the property of parabolas, if you know the width of parabolas and you know the separation between them, which is given by this quantity lambda, which is how high above the minimum of one parabola is another parabola. If you know their separation in levels, here there's no separation there at exactly the same energy level, but they don't have to be. Here's a case where one parabola is higher than the other, which is to say that the electron really wants to be on B, not on A. Well, just from geometric rules of parabolas, you will find that this crossing point can be expressed in terms of delta G0. That's the difference between the bottom of these two wells. It's called the driving force. And the so-called reorganization energy lambda. And that's expressed here. And so what you end up with is that the, the rate constant for electron transfer has some sort of a prefactor. And that includes things like collision frequency, uh, alignment. Let's, for the moment, let's not worry about that. Let's think maybe it has something to do with entropy. And then here is the exponential that looks like a transition state theory expression. It leads to some interesting effects. So for instance, uh, we have the so-called inverted region in Marcus theory. So if you look here, when these are at equivalent energy levels, there's a barrier that is a certain height. It turns out to be lambda over four is where that ends up being. You see if delta G is zero here, I'll get lambda squared over four lambda, so that's just lambda over four. On the other hand, as I make delta G zero equal to lambda, the driving force, now I'll get negative lambda plus lambda, I get e to the zero, uh, so I basically have this kissing uh, of the two parabola right at the minimum of one, so there's no barrier at all. But then if I make the driving force even stronger, the parabola starts to climb up the other side. The product parabola climbs up the other side of the reactant parabola, and I reintroduce a barrier. So it leads to this bizarre prediction, Marcus theory does, that rates increase as I increase the driving force until I increase it so much they start to decrease again. And that's known as the inverted region in Marcus theory. And uh, people thought it was uh, goofy, actually, when it was first proposed. There was no way a rate could possibly get slower when the driving force got larger. But eventually that was proven true. Uh, careful experiments did establish that. And of course, uh, Rudy Marcus was awarded the Nobel Prize for his work on electron transfer theory several years ago. But what about kinetic isotope effects? Well, they're hard to uh, put into the system. One way to imagine doing it is simply to have it in the driving force. So the driving force involves the zero point vibrational energy that will change as I go from a light isotope to a heavy isotope in these systems. And that means that this delta G zero driving force will change and I would get different rate constants for different isotopes. One can also look at sort of tunneling of the electron uh, through barriers and that is associated potentially both within the, uh, the Z term as well as maybe an influence in delta G. Uh, that's beyond what I want to talk about, but I just I wanted to introduce Marcus theory at least as a uh, 
as a kinetics issue, and then also to mention the kinetic isotope effect issue associated with it. Well, it has been a challenging and enduring semester of computational chemistry. We've covered molecular mechanics, semi-empirical molecular orbital theory, Hartree-Fock theory, post-Hartree-Fock theory, multi-configuration self-consistent field theory, density functional theory, and then we've looked at uh, properties of molecules, at the effects of solvation, at simulations, and more recently excited electronic states, and finally we're just wrapping up kinetics and dynamics. I want to say how much I've enjoyed uh, having a chance to share what expertise I've managed to acquire over the years with uh, all of you, and I hope that you have gleaned useful information from it and found the experience uh, hopefully even more rewarding than I, uh, or maybe less, but anyway, a little rewarding. So I'm going to wrap up then with a really lurid animation because, you know, you have to be a little over the top when you get to the end. I'm going to say thanks for sticking with these various lectures. Uh, I hope that you go on to do great things, and I appreciate all the time that we spent together.